as their data. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is, is getting the group of scientists together and understanding that one scientist is interpreting the visualization, even though it's the mathematics, and, and, and time and again, I've seen that scientist with a group of scientists explaining to them how he visualized it, and then, then gleaning more information from that person on how they might be able to go forward and visualize the information. It gets really complicated. Um, what we're doing just with the hydrogen-like atom that you're seeing behind us is the fact that this is the first element of the periodic table. It has one electron, and when you study it in a science book, you know, it looks very neat. There's this like little, you know, nucleus, and you've got this electron that can be in different orbitals, but what the physicists tell me is, that the electron can go into superposition and it can be in different orbitals at the same time. And what we're looking at is a hydrogen-like atom which kind of combines these wave functions and they're trying to glean insight from some really basic functions that happen even in hydrogen. For instance, there's a way that hydrogen can get excited to the point of where the electron will go into two orbitals close to one another and it will beat and that's one way to emit a photon. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult depending upon the researcher that you're working with and the place that you're in. We're in a very interesting place. We're kind of stuck between two worlds because I've chosen as a technophobe and as an experimentalist to work with other experimentalists and technophobes. And most of my experimentalists in this building, the California Nanosystems Institute, don't really use computers to process their data. They're, in, they're using lasers, they're firing lasers into atom lattices, they're doing their experiments. And so it's, it becomes difficult for them because sometimes they don't even visualize. Um, so where I'm at right now is really at this point of really trying to unite fabrication seamlessly to visualization. So trying to get to the point of where one of my colleagues at Iowa State, her name is Judy Vance, she had a lab that was called Metal. And you'd go into her lab and she had these huge columns of fluid flow. And in the corner she had this virtual 3D screen and she was controlling all of this fluid from this virtual simulation, from this virtual real experimentation in real time. It's not something I see often, but when it happens, it really does get exciting. We're just to the point, I mean, if you think about where we are and we jumped off the cliff, you know, as artists being in a very powerful materials building, and it's taken us, you know, 10 years just to build the software infrastructure, but with content driving the technological platform. So the hard thing is, you know, experimentalists, science, domain scientists will come in and say, what, what discoveries have you made? You know, and we're saying, well, you know, we're building, what we're doing is so bleeding edge on the technological side, it's bleeding edge on the discovery side, but we believe that both of those worlds, you can't build a system and then say to a domain scientist, come in and use it because they're, they're not gonna be able to. That's been the biggest problem. So for us, the hardest thing is we've just now gotten to the point of actually getting the software to the point of where it's really becoming stable, where we're able to now modularize our back plane so that people don't have to use our audio engine or our visual engine. They can actually start to intersect their their, their software into it, like open frameworks, or our scientists use Paraview and BTK, these other tools. Once I can get them onto the platform using tools that they're used to using, then we're really gonna make headway with the scientific discovery part. One of the most interesting things that we've done that's really pushed the envelope in the Nanosystems Institute that has the attention of our material scientist is that they're, um, it's very difficult for them to know uh, where the materials are going to fail at certain points in their material. And we've been able to put data sets together from the atomic level that, from different microscopes. And when they can come in and they can see those data sets at human scale, and we turned it around to what they call the grain boundary. And the grain boundary is where the grains will go in different directions, and that's typically where you'll get the failures. They were just, it was an aha moment for them because they could see these very important intricate places in their material and they could actually get to the point of being up close and personal with an individual atom that might have been either causing um, the material to be stable or not. 
for me, I see, I, I see a stabilization of the field. I'm hoping that we can really start to get our software out there. We can have an open source infrastructure that will allow us to connect different systems, different instruments together. You know, I, I mean, you know, I'm not opposed to helmets at all. And I mean, for me, because I've been working on what we call, one of my uh, PhDs just uh, finished his dissertation and he has coined the term IDAPs, Interactive Digital Audio Distributed Visual Systems. So the idea is going away from legacy systems, which a helmet is. I mean, it's a one computer, one helmet and getting to distributed systems, um, you know, for us, putting it all under one hood makes it easier for us to maybe get to the point of being able to distribute across helmets and be able to have interactivity where you can be with another person in a helmet and maybe eventually get to the point of having a sense of yourself in the helmet. I know a lot of my colleagues that are working on the AR, VR side are working on those, those ideas. So for me, you know, to be able to integrate the field so that we can work across these technologies with content areas that are going to drive those technologies. And for me, we've settled on three content areas that we believe are the constraints that we need to build what we call interactive um, distributed supercomputers. And that is um, structural materials, research and quantum information processing because we need new materials for information technology systems. We want foldable screens to put in our back pocket. That's why I'm in a building where we're working with OLEDs, organic materials and, and structural materials at the same time. So that area is very important. And the other area that a lot of people don't understand is abstract arts and arts and entertainment because that's where video gaming meets high performance computing. We're going to completely redesign interactivity and multi-user systems and abstract artists uh, have our domain agnostic oral and visual mathematicians that can map any spatial temporal data in time and space in any end dimension so uh, working with across those fields and hoping that we can kind of try to unite the field with a open source software kind of like unix was in the olden days and see uh, and and moving the system forward in that way and trying to get everybody on any instrument to understand that first of all what happens you know in a helmet is um, it can happen in the atmosphere you know so and that's a really important thing. So right now we are in his brain. This is the corpus callosum. It is the tissue that separates the right and left hemisphere. And this is not tissue. This is actually rasterized spatial locations of blood that come from the fMRI machine. So what we do is we typically, when we get in, in, uh, information from real um, instruments like fMRIs or from, uh, you know, GPS systems or from pictures, um, we take the software infrastructure of that data and we map it. So I can take off all of these isosurfaces and you can see the wireframe mesh of this brain that is really you know, uh, coming from the fMRI machines. All these little uh, things that you see in his brain, they're not there, they're intelligent agents. And what they're doing is agent-based data mining of the blood density levels. I just called them to me, and they're seeing the densities from the different lobes of the brain, saying what parts of his brain are active. So here's the Mandelbrot, it's the 3D Mandelbrot set. And this is a technique that Ken is doing called real-time ray casting, which is a very, incredibly difficult graphics technique, unlike OpenGL. Let me see if I can get us in here. Um, okay, so you are in a real-time interactive ray-casted bandle ball that can actually be um, turned into its counterpart. Let me see if I can get to it. The Julia set, which I'm going to bring this way. And he's actually got the coefficients so that you can scale and in real time turn any uh, fractal of these um, basic fractals one into another and make your own fractals um, as well. Okay, let's cut to some family. Yeah, just switch the scenes. So yeah, so we can make any any backdrop of any scene, 
So this is where we can actually do virtual and real, and this really gets us into interactive cinema practices, et cetera. We do, I mean, we're definitely looking for collaborations because it costs me a lot of money every time I light it up and we don't really get any support, but uh, that still doesn't mean that we don't open it up to the general public, which we do, because we are artists and we want to show our work. So uh, that's the other side of it. And I've built very small, I just built a very small uh, module in a, in a museum. And so there are different ways that we can actually bring this out. I'm actually going to South Africa next week to talk about how we can really democratize the community and everything that we're doing in here, we can do on Raspberry Pis as well. So uh, that really makes it so that anyone can, you know, really use this technology. Okay. So, um, and if you want to check out uh, Alisphere, um, University of Santa Barbara, as Dr. Germerin mentioned, they do give tours. Uh, they also have a GitHub page, which I would point you to if you're interested to see all the software that they've developed. It's really uh, cutting edge stuff. Um, so uh, definitely check that out. Okay, next we're going to bring on Sonny. Uh, he's going to tell you about his product that they've been working on at Cannabis. So we'll hand it over to you here. And uh, let's get your insights. Hi, everyone. Uh, good volume, too close, too close. Uh, hi, so my name's Sony, no relation to the company, and I'm here with Kinaviz. Uh, we are a small data visualization agency here thank you, um, over on Second and Bryant, and I want to talk to you a little bit about how we got into VR data visualization, some of the challenges we've run into, some of the things that have gone right, and also just a little bit of sort of the principles of what we think make VR, an effective data visualization tool. So, let's see. So this is actually the first project we ever did back in 2014. This is a visualization of file sharing on the Box platform. So it's kind of like Dropbox. Uh, basically, oh, where'd it go? No. Where'd it go? Uh, go back. Yeah. All right. I'm not gonna to touch anything this time. Uh, so each of those um, nodes is a user and then the edges between them represents a file shared. And what Bach wanted to do with this was just to show how collaboration on their platform was uh, enabling different companies and different industries to, uh, to, to really uh, have a sort of a force multiplier effect and that was really a, uh, for us, it, as our first product and sort of the or first project, uh, it got us some attention and we were actually, we were able to take it into VR because we had made it in WebGL. So it ended up being our first VR data viz project as well. And so then after that, we went and started pitching companies on our, approach to data visualization. And we came in, it was sort of confusing to people because we were coming as an agency rather than bringing a product. And they were saying, you know, are you, are you trying to be like a general purpose solution to take the place of Tableau or an Excel, or is this more like a D3, like a visualization platform, or R for hardcore analytics? And you know, as we learn more about the, the competitive landscape, we realized there were so many companies already doing really good work in some of the areas that we had initially thought we could we could shine, and so it sort of caused us to step back and reevaluate where our strengths were. And we, we actually end up uh, coming to the conclusion, you know, we don't we don't want to fix what's not broken. So we're not trying to replace any of the existing tools, the existing workflows. We're trying to create tools that were not there before. And we ended up going in a very much a specialist direction rather than creating a, a general purpose tool for everyone to use. We looked at these, uh, the box graphs again. Yeah, got it that time. Uh, to see, you know, sort of what were the things that we did well that really 3D took advantage of. And so 
Doing a, a very high dimensional multivariate data set with a lot of uh, elements was something that, oh, I was gonna pause this here and talk about how this is showing the different uh, file sharing patterns like the, fi the finance company at the bottom left you see is a very hierarchical uh, organization compared to say the software development company at the top left. The, the different footprints that these companies had sort of showed off a lot about the, the organizational structures and being able to see it in 3D and move through it, you were able to see some things that in 2D just either it would be too dense to really spot, or it would, it would simply be impossible to, to see the relationships between them. So focusing on these advantages to, to 3D, we, we ended up with our, our very first VR database client in kind of a similar project where this was a company that was taking blood samples and analyzing, analyzing the cellular activity within them. So they would create a whole string of 2D graphs and it would take a scientist maybe two hours to analyze a single sample. And by bringing their data into VR, we were actually able to bring that down from two hours to about five to 10 minutes. So a you know, 30 to 60 time increase in efficiency. And part of that is because we were able to actually show them things that they could not see in 2D, thanks to the way the, the elements moved as we applied different filters. So this was an opportunity to see how a really specialized solution could actually be a, a viable uh, line of business for us. So that was, the, you know, the, that's sort of the kind of this portion of things. And then I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir to some extent, everyone in here is already a VR enthusiast, but some of the things that make VR especially powerful for data visualization, you know, coming back again to the notion of movement, this is a, someone who was born blind and recently had uh, surgery allowing them to see but still neurologically had no background seeing, and so they're being retrained to see. And, and in this video, you, you can see they have a hard time actually distinguishing the different elements on screen when they're static. As soon as they start moving, they're very easily able to distinguish the circle and the rectangle. That is a, a phenomenon that can happen in 2D, but when you start getting into a really large data set, it's a lot harder to, to separate things out without movement. And part of the, the reason for this is that we have these two different systems going in our visual field. We have our, our central vision, which is when we're reading something or staring at a screen, so pretty much any traditional data visualization activity, you're, you're able to focus, but you're situational awareness is not really called into play. And with the, so that accounts for 10% of your vision, and the other 90% is your peripheral vision. So they actually occupy two different pathways in the brain, and the peripheral vision, of course, is really good for understanding a space and creating sort of a mental map in 3D, and also for identifying movement. So, you know, all of the whole spotting predators, spotting prey, that sort of thing. And of course, I, you know, I am not advocating anyone should ever text and drive at the same time, but the fact that we're able to, and again, please don't, but the fact that we're able to at all is a testament to the power of our brain to process these two different channels of information. And so we think this is an opportunity in really complex data sets to actually split up some of the cognitive load involved in, in dealing with the data set. So and this is just another example of how in central vision, it's really kind of hard to see what you're looking at. You don't, you don't have the context, whereas the peripheral vision, 
you're very quickly able to recognize the overall uh, quality of the seed. So one other element that we found uh, important in, in our work, not really related to the visual principles, but the notion of collaboration has been really important to us in how we work. You know, the, what we saw in traditional data visualization, there's already so many tools, so many niches that have been carved out, and with VR data visualization, we're just getting started. There's so much to learn and to figure out, and so any notion of competition or you know people stepping into each other's territory, it's, it's really not meaningful at this point in data VR, and which is really nice because it means that there's a lot of opportunity to sort of compare notes and try out different approaches and form a community around this. And this, you know, we're really excited to be here, the NGVR meetup. We also actually run our own data VR meetup that's you know, specifically for data VR. And we've, uh, we've also joined the VR ARA, the VR AR Association, and are running a data visualization committee there. So there, we're doing a lot of things to try and reach out to either other companies in the space or companies that are looking to do some sort of VR data visualization and looking to find out more about it. You know, there's a lot of really good tools, these general purpose solutions. We're definitely focused more on people who have the really high dimensional multivariate data sets. Uh, but Whoever you are, we would invite you to come to our meetup and talk to us. And uh, thanks for listening. Right. Anyone have any other questions? Yeah. We have time for one or two questions. And let me bring this. Hi, I have a quick question for you about applications for um, big data in business, using it for competitive intelligence. Do you know anyone who's using these kinds of tools in the realm of wargaming and statistical business projection and trend within a competitive landscape? We, we do not personally know anyone who is doing that. We've definitely, we've been approached by some companies that are examining that as a possible avenue, but if, if someone is doing that, and I would be surprised if there isn't, they haven't been making a whole lot of noise about it yet. So, probably, but we don't know who. Anyone else? I think I saw another one. Oh. So the world is dense with data, right? We're exploding with it. If you were to give a call to action to this audience of intelligent humans to apply these things to a few domains, what domains do you think are most ripe for this kind of interrogation? Gosh, uh, the, most of them. I mean, oh, we. Come on. <laughs> no, that's it. You set me up. Uh, we are particularly interested in healthcare and biotech. They're just cellular data, protein folding. There, there's so much to do there. We've heard of some really interesting use cases. finance as another possible avenue, even legal research. So I think it would be, it'd be harder to say, I'm trying to think of avenues that would not be fruitful for VR data visualization, and certainly anything that you can do successfully with a 2D tool, yeah, don't, don't try and do that in VR, I guess. I don't know if it's a question. I, <clears throat> I kind of, um, I, 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 was, I was just wondering about the job of debugging and then checking the accuracy on that kind of data read. That, that must have been gnarly. I mean, that must have been a long process to check the accuracy. And then also, uh, perhaps, have, you know, getting hired by a client and have them, you know, really convince that the accuracy is at 100%. Mm -hmm. What they're seeing is actually the numbers that are coming in. 
Yeah, so one thing that's been really nice working as a consultancy is that we work very closely with our clients. We're coming in and first off trying to understand what it is that they need to do and really every step of the way showing them what we're doing and saying, does this look right? And so, you know, ultimately it, it gives us an opportunity to, to bring them in a little bit to the, uh, the debugging process and generally we find that that gives them the greatest sense of, of satisfaction with the end result. Thank you, Sonny. Give me a round of applause. Okay, next, we'd like to invite Elena Kral. What up? Um, so, Elena is at Looker, and Looker has a product called Look VR, which we're going to talk about. Yeah, cool. Am I live? Am I? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're going to start with this one. Okay, can you hear? Oh, this one works. Hello. So, as I mentioned, I'm here because of a product called Look VR. Um, just this evening, I'm going to kind of talk you through the story of Look VR, and then I'm going to live demo it, uh, and then tell you a little bit about what we've found as we've gone around and tried it on people. Uh, so, just the basics here. Um, I work for a company called Looker. Looker makes a product called Looker. Uh, Looker is a data analytics platform, but the most important thing for you guys to know for today um, is that we have a data modeling layer, we also connect directly to the database, and we have an API, which is important because we're here to talk about Look VR, which runs off of Looker's API and is also able to take advantage of that uh, data modeling layer and the live connection to the database. So, some history of Look VR. LookVR didn't actually start as a product, it started as a project. Um, this is Will. Will is the creative genius and engineer behind LookVR. Um, we had a hack day and the challenge was to build something cool with the Looker API. Uh, so Will naturally built the beta for LookVR. <laughs> um, so he showed it off to the company and we thought it was amazing, which it was, uh, and so, we forced him to come to New York and present it at our user conference. Um, it was very well received, obviously, for the presentation, but what was actually really interesting is that when people put it on, they got really excited about it, and these aren't people who like, get excited easily about something that's like, maybe perceived as like, a marketing gimmick, um, it, but it made them so happy. So, we thought we maybe had something cool on our hands, so since then, we have released Look VR on Steam. Uh, there is a fun little mixed reality video for it. Uh, and we've also taken it around. So we took it to some trade shows, we took it to events, we put people in VR, um, and it was fun to see their reaction. So I'm gonna come back to that after I do a demo. Thursday night is complete without a word cloud. Uh, 
was really do this and look at the popularity of it over time. So Looker is now going back and running a new query and bringing me the popularity of the name Angel over time. All right, so what we have here is a scatter plot. Uh, on our x-axis here, we have the year the person was born. On our z-axis, we have the percentage of people with that name that were female. Uh, so the further right it is, the more male, and the further left it is, the more female. Uh, and then the height corresponds to how popular the name was. So what we can see is that Angel was fairly popular in like the 1900s, kind of like Tennessee. Then it really declined, and it you know kind of stagnated as far as popularity goes, but it really became far more far more female. You can see here, right? This whole thing. Um, but then it kind of it like went back up in popularity. It's a weird name. And it is like a this weird spike, right? And like you get a lot more from this data because of the third dimension than you would ever really get in two dimensions. All right. So we are going to go back to our original Olympic medals chart. And what we're actually going to do is lift it up because we need to move it up. We've kind of taken this around and uh, people have tried it. And so what I'm going to talk you guys through now is kind of like what we found because of that. All right. So uh, over the last six months, we've been talking to people about the idea of data visualization in VR for the enterprise. Um, and people are really excited about it, but they're also incredibly skeptical about it, which is very understandable. Um, so what I have to remind myself of is that this is cool, but it's not like, we're not looking at atoms here, right? This is not a perfect solution, um, but used properly, we might be able to like find some anomalies in our ad spend data, which is, you know, helpful. Um, so, and so what this means though, is that the technical, and the financial barrier to entry on this is actually a lot lower, which means that our pop potential population for this is a lot bigger. Um, so for data visualization in VR to ever really go, we need to do everything we can to reduce the friction. Um, and people think about this, I mean, the hardware is obviously a big portion of this, but we need to reduce the friction for the user, but also for the person who's implementing it and maintaining it, because um, I think that's something that kind of gets lost a little bit. Uh, so, if someone were to tell you, hey, can you build me a visualization, please? I'd like to understand maybe like our web data a little bit more. In a perfect world, you wouldn't be building this off of a CSV. Um, the second that you take data out of its source, it's stale. Um, so when someone came back to that a week later, it would be out of date. Um, so I think it's really important that we remember that and that we hold VR to the same standard. Um, for VR to actually work in a business, it has to be, as I said, easy to implement and easy to maintain, but it also has to give value. Um, and nobody is going to maintain something that every time you wanna try it again, you have to upload something new or you have to build it again. And because no one will maintain it, no one will use it, and thusly no one will maintain it. So, the logical thing to do is connect VR to a database, but 
we don't really want to like put VR in its own little silo. Nobody puts VR in the corner. Um, so what we really want is it to kind of live in the world of our other data applications. Um, if it lives in the same ecosystem as the data that you're using for your dashboards and your reports, but also for your statistical models, and anything that's coming out should be coming out with the same data. Um, and so that way, when you find an insight in VR, because there are insights to be found, um, instead of having to question the validity of the data, you know that it's exactly what you should be looking at, and you can drill in and you can learn more, but then hopefully you can save it you can pull it back down on your computer, you can send it to a coworker, and they can open it up in VR. And all of a sudden, we have data sharing in VR. Da, da, da. Um, so, thus far, we've been talking about VR as kind of like a stand-in for other visualization tools. And what would be really great is if VR could bring something totally new to the table, right? Bring some really new value. Um, and so Will has been thinking about this. Uh, and our engineers are kind of working on it. We are not, we do not have a glut of engineers, but we are hiring in Santa Cruz and San Francisco. Uh, so, but we're thinking about it, right? And one of the things that I'm most excited about is the idea of multiplayer. Um, there are collaboration, there are tools that allow you to collaborate and work on data together, but you're still in a browser, right? And even if you're doing it over video conferencing, right, you're still like going over to the other tab and looking at Reddit every five minutes or so. Um, but if you could imagine a world where I could put on my VR headset in Santa Cruz and my coworker could put it on in San Francisco and someone else could have it on in New York and we would not only be like looking at the same data, we would be looking at the same like chart, right? Like I could move it around and I could point at things and they could see me moving it and pointing at things. I could see their little like avatar mouth move when they tell me that I'm wrong, right? And all of a sudden, like, data is now, like, the center of this entire conversation. And it's, like, a truly immersive experience in this data, which I think is, like, that would just be so cool. Um, so that's kind of my spiel for today. Um, the the th final things to remember is that for data visualization in VR for the enterprise, uh, to ever, ever work, it has to be... Uh, what does it have to be? It has to be valuable and it has to be relevant. Uh, it also has to be easy to implement and maintain. And it has to live in the same world as the rest of your data. Okay, questions for our one? Yes, in the back. Um, so I've played with Looker VR, it's really cool. Um, awesome, glad you heard that. The, um, so effectively though, you were showing three or four dimensions of data. Um, but with the addition of VR, have you guys seen this sort of a practical upper limit on how many dimensions you can actually look at practically in there and actually be able to get some insight from? The number of dimensions, we have not dug into that, no. Um, we do have actually some, we've had a customer that has tried this out. So if you are a Looker customer, you can enter your API credentials and try Look VR on your own data. Um, and we had a customer that dug into their financial data. Uh, we actually have a visualization here that's uh, stacks of money. Uh, and that went over really well, and I think there were a few insights found there. So I've played with flat screen looker, which I really like, but I haven't tried look VR yet. And I was going to ask, one of the big value props I've seen with looker is that you can actually write those queries in real time and have your charts update. So is there an equivalent of that in look VR yet, where you can actually continue processing the underlying data and have the visualization change along with it, rather than just something pre-built? Totally. Um, so what we have now, I would say, like, is equivalent to like a pre-built report. Um, if you go in there, you can change the filters and you can change kind of what it's doing. You'll also see that we drilled in, and when that's happening, like, it is going and asking the database for more data and coming back up with it, right? So that's fresh. One of the things that we are still working on for the foundation of this is to actually add the ability to explore and look VR. Um, it's a complicated UX problem, I've been told. Uh, <laughs> but it is something that we're working on. So kind of. <laughs> One more? All right. Hey, there you go. I have a 
suggestion. Okay, let's hear it. The word cloud or whatever you call it, it's, I think it's a uh, way too complicated. So maybe instead of the top 500 names, we need the top 200 names. Is or that what you're suggesting, maybe? Or maybe just have a, like a wall of the names instead of a word cloud. All right, I'll take your suggestion under advisement. I'll, I'll, send, it, I'll send it up the chain. Thanks. That's good. All right, let's give a round of applause. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. John Voris. Um, didn't uh, give you my full credentials at the top of this. I'm uh, CEO founder of Primitive. We visualize computer code in VR. Um, I'm going to talk here about the uh, data that's contained inside of code. Code is a very code-rich substance. Uh, is a very data-rich substance. Um, I'm really glad to follow both Sunny and Elena because they set up some really good. Um, foundational concepts here for uh, how data visualization can actually unlock um, new insights. And I, I really like the point that Ellen made about collaboration because that's something that we really believe in as well. Um, being able to look at the same model of code and really have a team understand uh, what, they're, what they're looking at. Um, so we're fond of this quote. Uh, it's by Fred Brooks. He wrote The Mythical Man Month. Um, he's really well known in the software development uh, business. Um, the key point here is that software is very, very difficult to visualize. Um, it's notoriously multi-layered, abstract. Um, it's written by many different authors. And so when you're really trying to uh, put together a cohesive model of how the code works, um, you end up uh, oftentimes with, uh, you may have heard the term spaghetti code, um, you get a spaghetti visualization. It's something that's just a lot of information you're trying to link together and figure out how it all flows. Um, so he said in his essay that it's uh, inherently unvisualizable um, and therefore it lacks the, uh, it, it then um, you lack a, uh, as he says, it impedes the process of design within one mind, it severely hinders communication among minds. This gets to the collaboration point. Now, this was written in 1986. Uh, since then, technology has evolved, especially display technology. Now we're living in a modern era of virtual reality where we can do a lot more with visualization. And so at Primitive, we believe that we've solved some of this problem by bringing code visualization into a three-dimensional environment, into VR. Um, so what we do is we uh, visualize code structure, we visualize code debugging, so I'm actually gonna show you a live running program and, and the sort of the inner, it's the x-ray vision of what the program is doing on the inside. Um, and we do it collaboratively. Uh, so you can actually, we've actually worked with teams, uh, distributed engineering teams, it's very common now when you're working on a software development project, you're working on, with people around the world, people you've never met, you're pulling an open source code um, somebody else wrote that's uh, many miles away. And so it's really becomes a challenge to get inside of their mind uh, and, and really understand how the code works. Um, so that's what we do with Primitive. We're ultimately creating a communication tool um, using data um, to help engineering teams understand the code. Um, our ultimate vision here is we want to uh, have uh, we're re really trying to be the GitHub of VR, or more like you know the Minecraft for code. Um, you know, you can imagine one day uh, you want to build a program and you put on a hit headset. You enter this virtual world where there are quite literally software engineers just flying around all over the place working on different um, code projects. Uh, we actually pull in code from from GitHub all the time and uh, upload and load it into our visualization engine. Uh, we're building a library of visualizations. Um, their uh, last number I saw was that on GitHub there are 59 million repositories. Each repository may contain anywhere between 1,000 and 100,000 or 10 million lines of code. So there are many, many billions of lines of code out there in the world. We want to create a landscape for that. Something that uh, is a world that engineers can actually walk around inside and really understand things. And both engineers and non-engineers, we really just want everybody to be able to connect with software and understand it. Um, so I'm going to show you now um, a little bit of what we do. I'm going to uh, also do a live demo. 
So we'll see how this goes. I'm going to switch it over, and we're going to be showing you um, a couple of projects that we visualized. A small one, just get our feet wet a little bit, and I'm going to show you a, a, one of the bigger projects we visualized, uh, which is a 7 million line code base. So it's really fun to see this kind of data on the big screen. And since I'm a VR pro, I'm going to hold the mic while I'm doing this. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, so what we're looking at first, um, this is the small code base. This is just 14,000 lines of code, um, which is, you know, it's, it's sort of like um, a moderate size program. Uh, it's a little visualization application that we downloaded off of GitHub. Um, it was written by a, a team of engineers who were just interested in actually uh, visualizing data. This is a data visualization code base itself. What I can do here in this environment is I have this structure that represents um, the directories inside of this project. So this is like the folder structure that the engineers um, laid out their information. And already I can see that there's some organizational hierarchy here to this data. So I'm giving uh, sort of a layer of understanding at the very high level of how this project is organized. Um, imagine seeing this project, but instead of a bunch of folders, um, we actually have it laid out in this 3D space. Um, so inside of here I can open up a uh, directory and I can actually scroll through and I can start to see um, some of the classes that are defined in here. So I'm seeing a bar graph view um, and a calendar view um, and these other view states for this particular application. So um, what I'm, uh, so as I said, it's, it's a data visualizer. Here's, here's a list view. I can drill into this and now I'm going to start to see some variables that are set here along the top. Um, and then I can also look at the actual code inside of these methods. Um, and this is really fun when we're doing code reviews. Uh, so this is when a group of engineers need to get together and really um, uh, look at their code and, and really assess it and make sure that it's being written in a way that follows good practices. Um, so you can actually uh, scroll through lines of code here and maybe take notes and like let's say underline a section of code that you want refactored and um, you know maybe um, a whole section that you need to move down somewhere. So we just use this as a markup environment um, that you know again a team of engineers can really get inside here and um, really uh, get to um, analyze their data. Um, we show relationships inside of the code. So for instance, um, so up here there's an interface. Um, I can actually see other places where this uh, class is referenced in the project. So that's nice. Uh, one thing that you get when you do a spatial visualization is your brain is actually mapping out where this information is. Um, so you can really come to understand. Uh, you can actually remember what you're seeing uh, for a longer period of time. Uh, a lot of what Sonny was saying about um, your peripheral vision, just understanding the space that you're in, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of data that shows, and we're actually gathering this data ourselves, that shows that when you see something in the spatial layout, you're actually more able to remember it a week later, a month later. We actually had um, an engineer who we talked to a year ago who we showed um, a code base layout, and they could still actually describe it to us um, in pretty vivid detail, uh, just, just from the spatial mapping that they made. Um, so here I'm going to show you what I alluded to, which is the runtime. This is actually going to show the story of the code. What you're seeing here is this program actually running, um, and it, at runtime um, in a, a computer program, you actually generate objects, and you see um, how they're being accessed by the virtual machine in this case. Um, and what we're going to see here is this model get built, uh, which is the runtime state of the program. It's really fun to watch these because it's really, it is, you're watching a um, computer computing. This is really, truly uh, something that you can um, uh, really uh, sort of appreciate a whole new level of how software works, the software architecture, and the sort of living diagram of um, how this information is displayed. So we're just seeing this model constructing itself, and then I, if you see off to my side here, I've got this um, flame chart. Um, this is just showing me the current progress inside of this runtime. Um, so this is also helping me to sort of navigate um, the timeline of events uh, as they proceed here. Um, but in any case, I can use this to actually debug the software. This is really important because keep in mind that in code, um, you're dealing with something that is constantly changing. There's uh, variables are getting set different times, um, so therefore you might have conflicting, uh, you know, access on on a particular variable uh, where where timing is dependent. We've actually had engineers um, who've uh, debug really complicated 
parts of their code because it's, it was so uh, uh, state dependent. Um, there's a notoriously hard bug called a race condition, which is um, really, really hard to understand because it depends so much on timing. Uh, in this environment, you're actually getting to see those many layers of information that Fred Brooks was um, referring to, which is um, you know all the different abstractions that software gives you. Um, here, it's just laid out in this 3D environment where you can really uh, see it all. Um, I'm going to pause this one, and I'm going to switch over to our other big code base. Uh, I mentioned this one's 14,000 lines of code. I got a couple others in here. I'm going to first load um, this one, uh, Elasticsearch. This is a company that we work with. Um, it's a, a search engine. It's like Google for your data. Um, so I've actually, all these code bases are, are data themed. Um, this is a million lines of code. And the fun thing here is as this model loads in, um, I can actually see just in one swoop here uh, the entire layout of this project. Um, th this, it's true, you, uh, for the software engineers in the room, you'll appreciate this because um, it's so hard when you first are presented with a new project to really get your bearings. And in this environment, you can just really um, use the space to actually uh, um, you know, figure out the organizational hierarchy. So I can see right in front of me there's this primary package, which is Elasticsearch. And then branching off of it, um, I'm just actually just going to focus in on, on this one on the left. I see the search um, package. So this is where the, all the search algorithms are, um, are running. So uh, with this code base, this is a good example of where scale really shows. Um, I've got one more here I'm going to finish on. Um, this is IntelliJ IDEA. This is seven million lines of code. So I'm going to load this one up. Um, and we actually just uh, built out this technology so we could stream in these really large um, uh, code bases. So I'm really excited to show you this to you guys because this is really this one's really impressive to look at. Um, so a million lines of code on Elasticsearch, seven million lines of code on IntelliJ IDEA. Um, this one, uh, when you see it here in this environment, it spans um, 200 feet across. So it's this really, it's truly a landscape, it's a map. Um, so here you can see it, uh, it's just loaded up. I'm looking off my left, off in the distance. Um, so for reference, this would be like, you know, the buildings across the street. I'm, I'm looking at one part of this code base. Um, and over here, maybe another 100 feet off in the, in the background there is the primary uh, core of the, of the, of the um, software development environment uh, code. Uh, so this is a really big project, but it's, it doesn't even compare to some of the bigger code bases out there. Uh, the entire Facebook platform is 60 million lines of code. Um, all the code that Google manages is 2 billion lines of code. Um, so this, and that's just, you know, um, our, our favorite tech companies here in the Bay. Uh, there's millions of developers all around the world who are uploading uh, many, many millions of lines of code every day. Uh, we believe that this is going to be the future environment of how people collaborate on software. Um, and um, really bring people together in this shared environment where they can really understand and appreciate um, uh, the work that other people have done, understand it, integrate it into what they want to do uh, when they're building software. So happy to show people this one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, after uh, we wrap here on the on the presentations. But um, it's been it's been a real fun process building this. Um, we've uh, really learned a lot of things uh, both in the um, as I mentioned uh, the appreciation you get for the space the spatial memorization, um, just being able to really see many layers of information all at once in a 3, 3D environment. That really speaks to the power of visualizing data in this environment in 3D. Um, you can really do a lot of things that are otherwise impossible um, in a 2D environment. So uh, that's really been the fun part of this, is just the discoveries we've made looking at code, um, working with our customers, and just figuring out uh, you know, all, all new ways of looking at this information. It's been really exciting. Um, so anyway, happy to um, take questions, and uh, I yeah, thank you, thank you very much for. for I hope, I hope all of you. So you, you talked about memory and coming back. So how do you make your layout algorithm stable? Like if somebody adds a submodule, how does that prevent the drawing from going haywire? That's an excellent question, um, it really because uh, you know, you're constantly changing your code base, and therefore we do have to reflect some of that change in the layout, um, but we do actually have sort of an inertia in the model. Um, there's actually been other visualization engines that are sort of more freeform, they use force directed graphs, so they're much more chaotic. Um, and in the past, it hasn't really mattered in the 2D world, like where things are, you sort of just navigate and find where you're going. But this, we really do want to hack your brain and be able to have you remember Oh yeah, it was over on my left. I remember the search engine package was over on the left. So we have an inertia in the model where it, it, if something's been there for a while, it doesn't, it doesn't want to move. But, but great, great point, great question. Like I said, I believe you on memory, so thank you. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, definitely. Um, I had a question. Have you guys considered the idea of like a search or like a grep type feature where you could, you know, if you're doing some kind of migration, it might be useful to be able to see which files like are actually using that, that bit of code? Yeah, definitely. Um, the trouble there is input, right? So this is something you'll hear a lot in, in uh, the VR uh, lingo is it just uh, who's going to solve the input for things like searching, um, you know, if you, can, if you don't have a keyboard. Um, so uh, like doing grep to like find references, I mean, that's something you're used to doing in your IDE. We need to have a version of that here. And we've experimented with other things like, you know, just you, from just different ways to interact with the information using the controllers. Um, ultimately, like voice control would be a really cool thing. Um, just being able to use, uh, it kind of, if you had like a, a Jarvis in there, um, you know, you could talk to, um, you know, we're not building that, but uh, maybe somebody else will and we can, we can work with them on that. Uh, but yeah, we're trying, to, we're trying to be like Iron Man. It's definitely, that's the vision. That's a great question. The question is about diffs um, and doing revision control. Uh, so that's something that we're working on um, right now. It's it's uh, we actually see that um, you know one of the use cases here is tracking the change over time. As the previous gentleman was was pointing out, that's something that um, you know is going to affect your mental model of uh, how how things are, are changing. Um, it, we ultimately just want to build on top of uh, Git and just uh, pull that in, so we can maybe color code similar to how Git color you know. Or, Get uh, services that use Git, we color code things like you add something new, it's colored green, take something away, it's colored red. Um, but actually, even more than that, you can see the structure change, um, and that, that'll really tell you something. Okay, cool. Um, maybe we'll just take one more, and then uh, we're going to go to demos after this. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious if you've seen uh, any patterns emerge as far as uh, different code structures and how people lay out and build functional programs and whether or not you can spot the difference in techniques and maybe the efficiencies in one technique versus the other. Definitely. And then as a follow-up, has seeing this and experiencing this yourself uh, changed the way that you understand the way that you write code and how you build things? So I'll hit both those points uh, in that order. So um, number one, on the uh, sort of the um, insight that you get right when you see code for the first time. So we, we pull in new code all the time, and it's such an exciting moment when you, you get this graph that just gets spit out. We've written these algorithms so that they're all procedural, and they just, they just generate some structure based on some loose set of, of uh, algorithms. And, and you get like a unique fingerprint for each code base, truly do. On top of that, you also are seeing a true reflection of how the code is organized and how, and how it works. Um, there's something called Conway's Law, which is uh, code is really a reflection of the organization that wrote it. Uh, put another way, um, code is 90% written for people and 10% for the machine. Something that you know might not be, be uh, intuitively obvious, but truly like, it, it's really more a way to communicate to other people your design process. So what you'll see is like an organization that's really flat and distributed, the code is very flat and distributed. Uh, a, an organization that's very hierarchical and monolithic, you get a big monolith, you get a big piece of, a big slab of code that's just, just all entangled. Um, so we see that depending on who we're working with, um, and it's really cool. Every time you spit out a new visualization, you see fingerprint of it. That's why we keep that reference chart up at the top, just so you can actually compare the code side by side. Um, for me personally, I'll never forget the first moment when we got um, this running, and uh, we can actually see the animation of the code base. Um, because it's, it's the thing that you see in your head like, for your own code, but you really can't see it for somebody else. Like, I, and me personally, I, I'm, um, I'm a self-taught programmer, and a lot of this came from a desire to be able to understand code better, just really appreciate um, you know, other people's work. Uh, and I just, I just needed an interface for that. I needed something that I could get my hands on, my head around, and be able to just move side to side and figure out what's going on in there. Something that's like alive. Um, and we really, we bring the code to life here in our, in our engine. Um, and uh, the first time we did that, like it just it it's it's the kind of moment you get in a VR experience when you just you get the chills like it's just it's just a wonderful thing to see. Um, I we haven't seen there's there's other people who are doing uh, similar work to us, but it's it's a really cool space to be in, um, and we're learning a lot. So um, so it's it's been fun so far. Um, but again, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move into demos now. Um, for me personally, uh, we'll be just continuing to do this demo on stage. If you want to ask more questions or, or find out more about Primitive or any of our other guests, um, they'll be hanging around here doing demos. Uh, Looker is going to be in the back here, um, and uh, yeah, you guys have been a great audience. It's been it's been really fun. Thanks for thanks for listening.
Thank you again so much to everybody that turned out. Um, as John said, we've got a bunch of demoers. So we've got FinTech VR. Um, we have Sam from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. We have Looking Glass VR, Noda, Gun Violence VR by Julia Geist, World, and Click, and then Finger Foods as well. So tons of demos to try out, and um, please help yourselves. There's a, I think there's maybe a couple more drinks left in the back and some, some pizza, so um, make yourselves at home, and uh, thank you again so much. So nice to meet you. Oh, it's here. Ah. This is Savage. He's the co-founder of Kennedy.
Before I run, are you guys doing any finance work recently? Um, you know, we were, Wei was talking to, I guess, Bailey, but, um, yeah, I know, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, different band. Um, that's exactly, no, I don't, yeah, no, I, but other than that, no, we haven't really, is that, I mean, that was what you guys were yeah. focused on. Well, that's why I'm also be working in next. I'm going back to my quant roots. Mm -hmm. So I need to get settled in first, but I might have a conversation about sort of high-dimensional time series data, especially for some fairly heterogeneous data. It's very well. Fairly heterogeneous data. So we. One of my job is going to be data spelunking and trying to identify new data sources. Yeah. So because we also get into these things. Well, so so we actually we had an inquiry. Um, Basically, these guys were like talking about the trading floor of the future. What is VR going? You know, how is it going to be? Alex, what's your name? Without having necessarily. This was the meetup. You got the Bitcoin. These guys were actually from London, but but they were. I guess they were on behalf of Shell.